this applies to you, and keep them raised for me, please. Raise your hand if you were once 15 years old. Don't worry, it's not a trick question. <laughs> keep them raised. If you struggled or you knew someone that struggled with either addiction, crime, or gangs, keep them raised. If you struggled or you knew someone that struggled with depression, low self-esteem, no self-worth, do me a favor, look around you. Look at those next to you, look at those across from you. Okay, now, keep them raised if you were then faced with spending the rest of your life in prison. I was one of those 15 year olds. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in a family of seven, and I was the youngest of four boys. Now my three older brothers, they all struggled with things like crime, addiction, and gangs. And from a young age, I was always looked on to be the quote, good one, because I was the youngest. And at the time, I wanted that. I wanted to go on, finish high school. I wanted to go on, go to college, then have a career. Little by little, that changed. You see, I grew up in an environment where crime, gangs, and violence were the norm. From a young age, I saw crimes being committed in front of my eyes consistently. And things like assaults, robberies, overdoses, and even murder were a normal part of life for me. I saw this around me all the time, and a world without that kind of violence just didn't seem real to me. So from a young age, I started to struggle with the idea of like, how am I going to be a good kid with all of this going around me? At that age, I didn't know how to reconcile those thoughts. I didn't know how I want to be a good person, but this is where I see my life leading. So I started making some bad decisions at a young age. I started ditching school to go and get high and drunk with friends, so-called friends. For me, this was a way to like push all those feelings and thoughts aside. It was easier for me to numb that and do that than it was to face those feelings. I didn't know how to face those feelings. I didn't know that I wanted to face those feelings. Gradually, my decisions started to get worse. I started hanging around with gang members, and soon, I became a gang member myself. I started committing crimes for that gang. At the time and in that moment, I didn't see it or I didn't recognize it as hurting other people, even though that's exactly what I was doing. I saw it as I was trying to fit in, and I was trying to prove myself when I thought I needed to. It all reached a boiling point at 15 years old, when I made some horrible decisions. I was arrested, tried as an adult, and eventually I was sentenced to life in prison. Now, out of my whole incarceration, I gotta say that the first two years of it were some of the ho most hopeful moments that I had. I spent nearly two years in juvenile hall, and because I was there that long, I got to interact daily with staff and teachers. I got to know them, and they got to know me. More importantly for me, was that they treated me like a human being. I felt that they genuinely cared for me, and they genuinely wanted good for me. It made an impact on me. Then there were those volunteers that would come in every now and then to talk about their struggles with crime, their struggles with addictions, and how they had changed their lives, how they had grown. These interactions gave me hope. It gave me hope that one day I could change my life around and be a good person and be better. I had that childhood hope that everything was going to be okay, even while awaiting a life sentence. Then, reality hit. At 17 and sentenced to life, I was transferred to an adult maximum security prison. 
Now this was the late 90s and early 2000s, a time where a life sentence meant a life sentence. Hearing about somebody being released from this kind of sentence was like an urban legend. You would hear about somebody that heard about somebody that knew somebody that got out, but you never actually saw it. This was an era of warehousing prisoners, a time when we could be treated less than human. For instance, as part of my initial orientation into prison on my first day, at 17, I and other young offenders, young prisoners, were placed on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week lockdown with only the occasional shower here and there for three months, 24 hours, seven days a week in ourselves. This was my introduction to prison. Some of those earliest prison memories stick with me the most. By the time I was 21, I had seen multiple people get stabbed, assaulted, and even die. By the time I was 21, I had been incarcerated six years and four of them in adult prison. Rehabilitation wasn't a priority at this time either. In order to become better and get self-help, we had to rely on nonprofit organizations to send packets and pamphlets in the mail. And if you all know what stale mail is, you might understand that it took forever to get that. Little by little, I started to lose that hope that I could be a better person. I went into survival mode, and I did what I thought I needed to do to survive in prison, even if that meant keeping that gang mentality. For me, I didn't see another option at the time. I lost that hope that I had gained in juvenile hall. I didn't have the same type of investment that people were giving me in juvenile hall in prison. For over a decade, I kept um, wanting to do good, but making bad decisions. Slowly, I thought that this was where I was going to spend the rest of my life. And I would have been stuck in that cycle if not for a few different things happening. First, community members, prison reform activists, and some politicians saw the need to invest in youthful offenders and they started to change some laws that made it possible for me to one day go home. That was one thing. But the other thing that was more impactful and important for me was that I got to see firsthand how my actions had affected people. I got to see the ripple effect of that I had harmed one person, but it went beyond that. I had harmed families, communities, relatives, loved ones, Seeing that effect firsthand was what prompted my process to change. And it took many years still after that. It took work. By that time I was in a mature place where I could self-reflect on the decisions I was making. Gradually and eventually, I started taking responsibilities for my own actions. And I stopped being willing to do another's bidding. Instead of a gang member, I became a college student. Instead of getting in trouble, I started taking self-help. While in this process, certain people would come to mind. My family that always believed in me, an old baseball coach that always had hope for me, staff, teachers, and volunteers at the juvenile hall. They always invested in me the whole time I was there. That's what made an impact for me. I still had to earn my freedom though. I had to go up before a panel that decided whether I was eligible and suitable to be released. The first time I went up, I was denied five years. The second time, I was denied. On the third time, I was blessed and I'm grateful that I got a chance to get out, to be released. I had gone in at 15 years old, and now at 34, I was a free person. The world had changed for me. I mean, I assume that all of you out there have a cell phone. Imagine, how many of you have heard of a phone booth? Yeah. 
Back in my day, if we needed to send a message to someone, you had to literally pull over and find a phone booth and hope you had some change to make a phone call. But I've come a long way since I've been released about two and a half years ago. I've gotten my first job, my driver's license for the first time, my first apartment, my first car, my second car, my third car. No worries, I only have one now. And 18 years after I got, I got my high school diploma in juvenile hall, I earned my AA degree. Now, I have... I say that because I had help all along the way. And I had people investing in me, in me all along the way. Now I make it one of my purposes to invest in those that were in similar situations that I was. I get to go inside the juvenile hall now and send a message of hope to them. I share my experience with change with them and encourage them to do the same. I go in to talk to them, to help them where I can, even if that means just being there to listen, to show them that I see that they have their hand raised, even if they might not see it themselves. I want to show them that there are people that see them and people that want to invest in them. Part of my job also is to help community members, just people like you out there, invest in programs for youth and adults that have been impacted by crime, addiction, and incarceration. For those of you out there that are doing that work, they and I are grateful to you. For those of you that haven't started, Days as good as days in. You see, I've met many incarcerated people, people that have been uh, impacted by incarceration. I've met many of them in my life. And I can tell you this, most of them want to do good. Most of them want to be better. Yes, we committed wrongs. Yes, we should be held accountable. And you, I, us, as a community, as a society, should not see them as removed from society. We should see them as part of our society. We need more restoration and less retribution. I want to leave you with something that you all can do today. All of you saw someone's hand raised. I want you to think of a young person in your life or an adult that if they would have been in this area, in this seat, that they would have raised their hand too. Think of them. Think of the impact you can have on them if you were to invest in them or be there for them. That might just look like if you were to leave this place here, get on the phone and ask them how they're doing. That could look like showing up when they're in need. That could even look like volunteering at a shelter, mentoring someone that needs guidance. The possibilities are there. I promise you, if you look with empathy, and you see hands raised, you'll be surprised at the impact you can have. Thank you.